This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week we're joined by Daniel Spritberry, formerly of Sibelius and currently of Steinberg, who's currently working on an in-development uh, scoring application that we're looking forward to coming out somewhere in the near future. Uh, Daniel, thanks for being on the show. Thanks very much for having me, chaps. Glad to be here. Uh, so you uh, have been on the internet and been the public face of uh, Sibelius, I think, for a lot of users. We're all composers, and I personally am a, a longtime Sibelius user. I know uh, some of these guys have used Sibelius, and some of them haven't, uh, at least not as their main uh, their main tool. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved in Sibelius, uh, and then how then that that turned into your involvement with Steinberg? Sure. I'll try and keep this Just... fairly long story fairly <laughs> short. Um, so I first got involved with Sibelius uh, way back in 1999 when I was wet behind the ears, just a college graduate. I just finished my music degree. And I went off, not wanting to do an office job. I swore I would never do an office job. And so I, uh, I actually took up a position as a singer in the cathedral at Ely, which is just outside Cambridge, uh, which, was a, which was wonderful for the soul, but terrible for the bank balance. It really paid almost nothing. Um, so I needed to find another job to uh, to supplement the mega income I was making from the from the church, uh, so I did a bit of temping and all the rest of it, and uh, eventually uh, I I found out actually through the organist at the cathedral that uh, Sibelius Software, who were at the time were based in Cambridge, were looking for somebody to join the tech support team, and I interviewed, and they hired me. Uh, so I started in tech support, and I think that's really why. Um, I became sort of uh, a publicly known person associated with Sibelius because pretty much from my first day on the job, I would go onto the uh, forum um, on the website and answer questions and so on. And that became, to be honest, a bit of an obsession, <laughs> probably an unhealthy one for me over the years. And it would not be uncommon for me to uh, to not be able to go to bed at night <laughs> until I checked the forum to make sure that everybody was okay. But I kind of felt like um, in a way, that sort of customer service was a big part of the product, and it was a big part of the reason why people liked Sibelius, because we were a very accessible company. Um, and even though I actually moved out of tech support um, only a few months, well, no, how long? About a year or so after I joined the company uh, and moved more into first doing documentation and then... By the time we got Sibelius 2 out the door and we were thinking about Sibelius 3, Ben and Jonathan Finn, uh, who were the, the two twins who founded the company, uh, they sort of started to bring me more and more into the product development uh, discussions. And so from Sibelius 3 onwards, even though we didn't call it that at the time, I was kind of the product manager for the product and was the nexus between the customers on the one side and the programmers on the other side and trying to figure out what, what we should do and how. Um, but I always maintained um, that kind of public presence, partly because I felt that it was a really great way of understanding what customers wanted from the software. If I was actually engaging with as many of them as possible, it would give me um, a good perspective on it. Uh, but also because it was just, like I say, a bit of a dangerous obsession that, <laughs> that I developed in my early early part of my career and um, just kept it kept it going pretty much forever. Um, and so things kind of rolled on and rolled on and rolled on. And um, we were acquired by Avid in 2006. And uh, the events that followed, you know, generally speaking, we got more versions of Sibelius out. Things were great. Uh, but unfortunately, um, last year, Avid decided that they, they had to make some changes to the business and close some of their offices um, one of the offices they decided to close was the the London office where Sibelius was developed, and <clears throat> you know there was various jobs were lost as a result, and and the uh, original development team uh, were were basically um, uh, made redundant effectively, and so we all kind of finished working at the end of October last year. A few people had gone a bit sooner than that, but but the the core of us uh, stayed until the end of October. Unfortunately, by that time, um, Steinberg had uh, approached us and said that they were interested in in hiring as many of us as they could to start working on a new scoring program, which was just an unbelievable, uh, it felt like a miracle um, to all of us at the time. This is from the ground up. From the ground up, absolutely. Um, we'd, you know, the core of the team had basically been the same for many, many years. So 
Um, certainly, all of the guys who uh, who came with us to Steinberg uh, had basically been with the company for a minimum of five years, and in most cases, more like 10, 11, 12 years. So they'd all been around since Sibelius 2 and had been um, involved in developing all of the features, really, that had gone into the program uh, since then. And, uh, you know, we still had, obviously, lots of ideas about how we could carry on uh, developing the program, taking it forward and so on, had we had we been able to stay. Uh, but at the same time, it is uh, both a, a wonderful and slightly frightening <laughs> situation now to be, uh, to be uh, given, effectively, a, a blank slate uh, by Steinberg, who have said, hey, we want you to build um, a new a new professional level scoring tool and we want it to appeal to the same kinds of customers that programs like Sibelius Finale appeal to. Um, and obviously they also want to, to broaden their own customer base. Uh, they've got obviously a, a tremendous audience in that kind of electronic musician world with Cubase and Halion and all of the other VST instruments and so on that they, that they make and then the high-end post world with Nuendo. But I think the, uh, you know, certainly in my experience when I was working on Sibelius, the overlap between, say, Cubase users or Logic users or Pro Tools users or whatever and Sibelius was relatively small. So I think Steinberg see an opportunity to actually broaden their customer base by building a new scoring program. I can imagine that's a, a, a pretty big challenge, um, having all of the, well, all, many of the developers from Sibelius and your, the idea is to create something that's not Sibelius. Um, so I mean, like, of, of course, your 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 job is not to create another Sibelius, but a new, a brand new program that is original and has something else to offer. Absolutely, yeah, and and I think um, it's it's actually, I suppose, like maybe I was a little bit worried about that to begin with. You know, we we arrived um, in some temporary office space in the, in the beginning of November last year, and we basically spent the first pretty much month, slightly more than a month, actually, uh, just the the 11 of us, as it was then, basically sitting around in a circle and kind of doing a brain dump and uh, discussing the uh, features of not only Sibelius, but also Finale and other scoring programs and kind of trying to do a, a broad um, sort of survey of the requirements that we might want to address in the new program. When we started that, I don't think we really had a clear vision for what would shape the new program. But actually, by the end of that process, by the end of that four or five weeks, I think we'd already really hit upon the what we are now working on as the core concepts of the new program. And they are quite different um, from Sibelius in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of the way the program is going to think about music. Um, unfortunately, I can't go into too too many details today. I would love to, um, but we uh, we have to keep certain things kind of under wraps while they're so early in development, particularly because we don't a know exactly when it'll be finished and b know exactly whether our ideas will work at this stage. But uh, but we are but yeah, I think at the at the beginning, I don't think we really kind of knew what our angle was going to be in terms of what was it that we were going to do that was going to make the program unique and differentiated from Sibelius. Obviously, we we knew that on one level we had an opportunity to address any shortcomings that we felt uh, were, had sort of arisen in Sibelius, not necessarily through anything that we'd done intentionally, but more perhaps through the fact that, you know, over time and the more mature a product gets, actually, the more expensive it becomes to try and address things that are sort of fairly fundamental to the way the program behaves. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, so we kind of can think about some of those issues and try and address them you know, from from the from the beginning. Of course, there are risks associated with that. You know, there's this famous thing in computer science called second system syndrome, where basically, if you get the opportunity to do something from scratch, um, you can spend a great deal of time obsessing over all the problems that you remember from the first system, and you can spend so long worrying about how to solve those and over engineering solutions to those that you can you can actually end up losing sight of the of the end result that you're actually after. And I think that's probably the main thing that kind of I wouldn't say it keeps me up at night, but I, I worry about it uh, because we we all have we all remember things that didn't go quite the way we wanted them to. It's the same with any complex software product, of course, but um, we want to make sure that we we don't fall down any rabbit holes as we start work on the new program. Right. So uh, one thing that I think is really interesting about how you've embarked on this project is how public <coughs> you have been. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we 
uh, decided to to try to get in touch with you and, and invite you on the show is that it seemed like you were trying, you were making an effort to involve uh, the the public and your your future users from a really early stage, and I, I think that's a really great thing to do, and it's it's one thing that I really valued as a civilian user. You talked about all the time that you spent on those forums, and. Uh, uh, May I personally thank you for some of the times that you answered my questions? Uh, I was a very early Sibelius user. I, my first version of Sibelius was 1.2 or something like that. Um, and I would Vintage. often... Right. I would often be working on a project for school that was due. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't figure out how to do this thing. And he's going to make fun of me because I'm not using Finale. And it would just be easier if I just used Finale. And then I would go and you know, ask a question on the forum that you mentioned and within an hour or two, I would have an answer. And most of the time it was from you, uh, <laughs> which was, which was, which was great. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. And the documentation that you provided for Sibelius, I don't know how, how, uh, heavily you were involved in writing the documentation, but it's the only user manual that I have favorite passages from, um, <laughs> I, oh, well, I, I honestly do. There's a there's if if you have a Sibelius user guide, the PDF or a hard copy, there's a hilarious little bit in there about tremolos, and that doesn't sound hilarious, but trust me, it's hilarious. Tribulations of tremolo notation. Yes, yes. that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. Cl I didn't actually write that particular bit. Oh. That bit dates from just before I started working on it. So, when I um, when I joined Sibelius, the documentation was written by Ben Finn. In fact, he'd written most of the Sibelius for Windows user guide from a hospital bed because he had appendicitis <laughs> just before <laughs> Sibelius for Windows was being finished off. Um, but not long after I joined the company, I, I took it over. So, yeah, I, I wrote all of the documentation basically between Sibelius 1.3 or something like that, or maybe 1.2 and Sibelius 7. Um, and I enjoyed doing it. It was it was difficult. It became more and more difficult to, to kind of find the time, really, to do that and uh, do all of the kind of business, internal business things that I needed to do as part of, you know, driving the product through all of Avid's processes and things, and also, of course, spending time actually with the developers, making sure the development of the program was, was moving in the right direction too. And, you know, they, they're they amazing to collaborate with, uh, our, our programmers, because they, you know, they take my crazy ideas and they make them a hundred times better um, and often tell me where I've, where I've gone completely wrong, uh, which is great. But yes, trying to squeeze all that in was always a challenge. Um, well, well, the style of the writing is very approachable, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm sure I speak for <coughs> a lot of users when I say that I really appreciate that. Uh, it's very easy for something as as with as many settings and things to tweak. That's as, you know as powerful a tool to be very intimidating, and it's very much it's much less so having read some of that documentation. And I imagine based on reading uh, your blog that you're keeping on this new project for Steinberg uh, that that's going to help a lot of people with this new project as well. By the way, do you have uh, like an, any kind of name that you're using for this, just as a, just as a shorthand mm -hmm. that, that my, people are my using. Lips are sealed. No, okay, I so can't uh, well, I'm not I'm not asking you to share that name. I'm just asking if you have one. <laughs> well, we have we have a bunch of names. That I, oh, okay. <laughs> Operation uh, Ace. I've note. been spending a great deal of time trying to dream up the the proper product name for this thing. It's a bit like yeah. I don't know. You know how they say you shouldn't name your children uh, if you're talking about farm animals and so on. Well, when it comes to a software product that you imagine you're going to be spending several years of your life on, right, um, right. I actually find that it would be really helpful if we did have a name. But we don't actually have a final name for it yet. We have a bunch of ideas. Um, none of which I can share, unfortunately. Right. But uh, we so haven't. We haven't. The office is just yet. like. The thing. That thing. The, the thing, yeah. <laughs> Pretty well, much. That's all it is really? for us. This is that thing the Steinberg guys are doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would be useful if we if we had a name. And I, I hope we'll come across you know, we'll we'll decide on the name long before the thing is actually ready to ship so that we can share that name and, and have people talking about it. Because of course one thing that is slightly uh problematic is that it's oh it's that thing that the former Sibelius guys are working on I right. think it would be better if people were talking about what we're working on now rather than what we were working on right. in the past yeah. so um, yeah but regarding the blog uh, Dave yeah I mean it's uh, it's actually something that the chaps at Steinberg were talking to me about 
right from the first conversation that we had, um, you know, last year. And they they really kind of, I think they they see the blog as I do actually as a really important way of of having a, a conversation with uh, your customers or in our case potential customers since we have no actual users yet but um, and it's been it's been fascinating actually to me that I've I've actually received um, a great deal more interaction through the blog that I've been running uh, for Steinberg even though I've only I think written five or six posts since it started in February whereas with the Sibelius blog I was trying to get two or three posts a week out um, but the the level of interest in each of the posts that I have I've uh, written so far on the Steinberg blog have been just incredible. I've been uh, inundated with comments both on the blog and emails and things, and it's it's wonderful because it really it really helps us to feel like um, there is a genuine interest in what we're working on, and that there are people who are excited about it. And I just hope they'll still be excited about it by the time we actually ship the thing, because <laughs> that's a that's a way off. Uh, yeah. But we're going to try and keep the. Uh, lines of communication open um, and it's you know certainly that's always been very important to me to try and have as open a conversation as I can with um, you know with Sibelius users in the past and I certainly want to continue that uh, now that I'm working for Steinberg I think it's a crucial thing that will actually help shape this product and make it as useful as possible to as wide a range of musicians as possible. Yeah, and I think people like to feel like they really are having a hand in shaping this new thing, especially. Oh, when and they genuinely the are too. They genuinely are. I've I've received a lot of, like I say, hundreds upon hundreds of of comments and emails, um, and I've also obviously been going out and meeting with people in person as well whenever I can, and uh, you know that genuinely there have been dozens of of things that have come to us through you know people responding to the blog posts or, or meetings that I've had um, and so yeah it, it genuinely is making a difference to how we're approaching the development of the products and, and which features we're targeting uh, so I mean it, it's just it's very valuable to us because it helps helps us feel like we're steering in the right kind of direction when people either agree or sort of <laughs> violently disagree I haven't had too much of that yet but it does happen from time to time and that can be a really really valuable thing for us in terms of uh, pushing us in the right direction so, so if somebody did want to get in touch with you to give you some some feedback on what you've been doing or what they think scoring software is missing, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you and, and let you know those things? Uh, probably to email me directly, I guess. Uh, and my email address is d.spreadbury at steinberg.de, which I'm sure you can put in the show notes or something. Yep, absolutely. For folks. Um, I'm also on Twitter at dspreadbury, so folks can, uh, folks can find me there. Uh, I'm pretty easy to get hold of, and I don't mind being inundated. So, yeah, bring it on. Anybody who wants to tell me anything about how they think scoring software should work, please do get in touch. Well, speaking of how scoring software should work, <laughs> I, was I, thinking about, I was thinking about this Soapbox. the other day. Now, it's time for the gripe session where we're no, all no, going to no. yell at Daniel about the things we want it to do. Well, okay. I wasn't going to say that, but we could go there for sure. I, I was thinking that the, so the last... A uh, major scoring tool that became widely used before this was Sibelius, and that was made in the 90s, and Finale predates that f for a, a while still. This will be the first project on this scale that is at this ambitious since the advent of a, a few technologies that change the way people use their computers. There's mobile technology people with smartphones and tablets uh and then there's uh ubiquitous relatively ubiquitous broadband always on broadband internet um and so i i'm wondering if uh you have any plans to to work in and include some things in this new project that uh would be kind of a, a fundamental change that would be would have been much harder to do working with the old product from before that you can now accomplish because you're starting from scratch. 
Well, there certainly are things like that, although they're not necessarily related to uh, mobile devices and, and, and sort of the rise of broadband and so on. Although you're absolutely right, those are completely fundamental shifts in the landscape of, of personal computing over the last, you know, well, Sibelius for Windows came out 15 years ago. So that's uh, that's obviously a, a, an ice age and then a thawing and probably another <laughs> ice age in Internet time. Um <laughs> But I think, you know, I mean, from our perspective, I guess, we're kind of playing to our strengths, I suppose, um, in terms of the way that we're tackling things. Um, you know, there are some practical and commercial considerations for why we are, for example, now really worrying mostly about Windows and Mac software, although we are building the software that we're uh, that we're working on, or the, the sort of the core of it. We're trying to get that building on iOS and Android as well, because we certainly do want to have mobile um components to it uh, you know whether it's a mobile sketch paddy thing or some kind of controller or companion that operates with the desktop software uh, but that isn't a that isn't a, a, a sort of primary goal for us right now mostly because we're a relatively small team trying to build something as you say very ambitious and so we really have to focus our attention on where we're going to be able to deliver the most fundamentally value to Steinberg um, and that hopefully means in terms of delivering a, a substantial new desktop application that, that they can sell to lots of folks and people will be very happy with but we definitely definitely really value um, you know the the mobile ecosystem and we see lots of ways that we can take advantage of the things that mobile devices can do uh, but it's something that has to come I think as a secondary thing for us right now. Uh, rather than something that we're doing uh, in a in a sort of as our primary focus, but I think that there are things that we're able to do now that we weren't able to do in the in the past. I mean, this is a bit boring and technical, perhaps, but mm. the uh, <clears throat> obviously another massive change that's happened over the last few years in terms of the architecture of people's computers is they're much much more um, sort of multi-process basically everybody's computer has a quad core chip or a six core chip or whatever in it these days um, and of course that is that is how computing is going desktop computing and of course mobile computing I mean all phones have quad core processors now as well which is kind of crazy but they do um, but obviously computing is becoming more and more parallel and that's something that's going to continue rather than just being able to rely on computers getting faster and faster in pure clock speed increases in computing power come more through increased numbers of cores and parallelization. But to actually take advantage of those things, you need to program in a particular way. Um, and that was one of the things that would have been very hard for us to do in Sibelius because, you know, when Sibelius was, was first programmed, and obviously the original version of Sibelius was programmed in machine code on a RISC processor on the old Acorn um, Archimedes machines, and uh, when when Jonathan and the small team of programmers who who started porting it to Windows, uh, you know, did that job and went to C plus plus, there still wasn't really any such thing as even a dual core processor in those days. I mean, this was the days of four eight sixes and early Pentiums. Really, it wasn't. <laughs> we weren't in the world of you know core duos and all the rest of it. Um, so we always knew that uh, there was. You know, this created a fundamental problem whereby as what the software wanted to do became more sophisticated and it wanted to do more and more and more stuff, the processing became increasingly linear. So it would have to do this and then this and then this and then this, and then it would have to do that from the start of the score to the end of the score. Um, and those were the sorts of reasons why uh, as the program, or rather as your scores got longer and longer and longer in Sibelius, the program would generally start to kind of slow down a little bit. Um, and what, by the time you got to having a complete act of an opera, say, in a single file, operations, some operations at the end of the score could take an appreciably longer time than they did at the start. And that's really because of this kind of single-threaded approach, which was very common, you know, to, to applications built in yeah. that period or really up until recently. Yeah. So now we're, we're able to actually think about that problem, again, from the absolute ground up and think about how can we make the program more amenable to operating in a parallel fashion. And hopefully, nice. you know, this is all very boring and technical, but the, mm. the aim, hopefully, is that um, although we can't guarantee that the program will never get slower the longer the score gets, the hope is that the, the kind of degradation in performance that you'll experience as you get to extremely large scores will be significantly reduced compared to um, programs of the, of the previous generation. Yeah. I mean, I remember 
manually updating score layouts and for a long score you could you know hit the hot key to manually update the layout and then go grab a cup yeah. of coffee yeah I, I got a screen redraw going i'm gonna go to the bathroom right, right. <laughs> so that's that's very exciting that's very exciting uh i i i think uh making it faster is is great because you can it, it lets you share with with other people and not worry about like how beefy their setup is. It's, it's always been a concern with me. It's when I'm working on a big project and I want to show it to somebody else and I send them this file in an email, the file size, whatever, through email, bandwidth is, you know, everywhere and storage is everywhere. But when it gets to their machine, if they haven't invested in, you know, being able to make a big thing on their machine, then it's going to be a big problem for them. So I think yeah, uh, absolutely. it could help collaboration a lot. And th I think that's actually the if 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 I were to to request a single feature of a new thing, it would be <laughs> to make collaboration easy. <laughs> well, tell me so tell me what kind of collaboration is is problematic as things stand. Well, well I want to do things like I can do in Google Docs where you like right. see the people typing. That's crazy, <laughs> I know, for a score. That would absolutely not work in a score. But like that kind of that level of being able to share something with somebody over the internet is is. Well, I can see that as part of a teaching tool, though. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, you know, that's that's how I see it as a teaching tool. Well, I think there's also some some uh, use cases around uh, some of the projects that go on either in you know film and TV and musical theater and so on, where mm -hmm. obviously it's very common when you're pr oh, producing. Yeah a big score for a session that's happening tomorrow morning, you've got to have five or six people working on, you know, this guy's doing the winds, this guy's doing the brass, this guy's doing the percussion. Um, and I think that, you know, although that's a relatively small number of users, they would really love it if the software could um, allow them to actually be working on their parts individually, but actually all of those changes are automatically being fed into a full score so they can get something on the conductor stand with no extra effort. Um, so I mean that would be that would be super cool. I can't make any promises right. as to whether we're that would do be, it. That would be that would mean like running a crazy like database server or something that you can push and pull to like like GitHub for scores. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A real time GitHub for scores. It would have to be something like that, absolutely. Uh, but I think it would be it would be very powerful. And I think that is obviously a way that you could take advantage of, like you say, the ubiquity of broadband internet connections and and actually being able to to do that. But I think the funny thing is, of course, about scoring software is that there are relatively few use cases that actually involve real time multi person collaboration. You know, the typical workflow right, right. that involves scoring software is like. Composer sends something to orchestrator, orchestrator sends something to copyist, copyist then gets the music prepared for performance. Or, or possibly if it's a publication workflow, it's more like composer to publisher to editor to print, you know. So so there are relatively few workflows still that are that involve real-time collaboration with scoring, but but certainly um you're right that education is one potential one. I mean I I always kind of like the idea of of being able to send scoring software into a classroom and have a teacher say, hey you 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 know little Jimmy over there, you do the flutes um, you know, Francesca, you do the alto, uh, you know, you do the alto flute, or maybe they wouldn't be writing for alto flute, that might be a bit easier, <laughs> but, you know, you do the, you do the sound parts, you do the Wagner tuba, and then they could all uh, <laughs> collaborate together. And, uh, I've got and the sack, you, you just made a great, great chamber ensemble right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's been done. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that, you could also make the argument that the reason that work, that doesn't exist as a workflow is because... We haven't been able to use it as a system of workflow. You know what I mean? There's been no way to facilitate what we're talking about. Yeah, you might you might be right, of course. I mean, I, I sort of perhaps I'm a bit old fashioned. I kind of subscribe to the view of the composer as being the the isolated artist in his garret, you know, starving and living on horrible cheap food and, and sort of working on this labor of love that he believes will be destined that nobody will understand his brilliance and his genius. But of course there are plenty of more commercial and uh, practical use cases for scoring software too. Well, That's speaking of commercial and practical, one of the things that I'm very excited about, of course, you know, Avid makes lots of powerful, sophisticated uh, products, but having purchased Sibelius after it was already well-developed, it, it product integration seems like it would have been tricky. Whereas since you're building from the ground up and Steinberg has so many awesome products, 
thinking about product integration has to be a completely different job for you this time around. Absolutely. Um, and the, the, it's kind of, it's a two way street, of course, because on the one hand, um, obviously Cubase and Nuendo already have scoring features today, which are very deep. I mean, the, they, they really can do a huge amount, actually. If you really sit down and try and produce a score in Cubase, you can produce something that has, you know, every kind of specialized notation you can think of down to, you know, chord symbols, guitar frames, um, you know, various kinds of articulations, trills, tremolos, stuff that I think is not really possible in a lot of other sequencer programs. But the workflow in Cubase isn't great. Um, you know, I think probably if uh, if you were really focused on producing a score that wasn't just going to be something you would plonk down in front of a session player and have them just kind of play so you can record it, I think that wouldn't be the tool that you would choose. And I think that's obviously one of the factors behind Steinberg wanting to to bring us in because you know we have a bit of a bit of form in that regard, and we can hopefully bring some of that expertise to bear both in the short term, um, you know, in terms of some of the work that I've already done on things like fonts, you know, maybe we'll be able to kind of bring that into Cubase in the short term, mm. but in the long term also to actually uh, maybe integrate our technology that we're building now uh, in a much more deep way with Cubase and Nuendo so they can actually become uh, sort of part of that. And of course, in the short term too, an interoperability workflow between our program and, and Cubase is something we, we need to put, pay a lot of attention to because, if it's at all possible, we, we'd love it to be, you know, great to use our program with any other sequencer, but especially good to use it with with a Steinberg sequencer. Absolutely. And then in the other direction, of course, there's all of the amazing technology that Steinberg has developed over the years. You know, this is a company with with a legacy of of technological innovation that is almost second to none inside the uh, sort of music technology world. Not only having invented, you know, VSTs and practically invented the sequences and, and given birth to both Logic and Studio One, as well as uh, as well as Cubase and Nuendo, um, and they, uh, I think that what we would love to do is to be able to bring some of that world class technology that already exists in Steinberg's other products into ours. So you know that might mean borrowing some of the audio features from Cubase or the audio engine from Cubase or bringing in some of the uh, sample players and other virtual instruments that Steinberg has and kind of working out how to integrate them with our scoring program too. So yeah, it is it is very exciting to be able to uh, to look at um, that established portfolio. And, and you're absolutely right to draw the parallel between taking a mature product and trying to integrate it into another mature product. That's quite hard work. Uh, whereas hopefully, it's not to say that it's necessarily any easier, but it feels like we ought to have a better chance of understanding the shape of what we need to do in order to build technology that can be integrated into Steinberg's other products, um, because we're starting with that in mind, which was obviously never something that was was one of the original sort of design considerations for, for Sibelius. So, yeah, I, go, go ahead, ahead, Sam. Dan. I was... no. Well, I was gonna I was gonna kind of shift a little bit to this this uh, post that you put up on your blog this week, uh, yeah. it, and one of the the problems with developing any kind of software like this is it's a problem that um, the open source scoring program Lily Pond had was that they didn't have a font that they could use um, because all those all those shapes that go into the music notation thing are all controlled by somebody. Um, and so they had to create their own music font, um, and it's something that that you, I would imagine, have been involved in before. But you just announced on the blog this week that you have completed, or uh, completed, I guess is probably a tricky word for a project that's in <laughs> first uh, draft. This first, okay, so the first draft <laughs> of a of a music font called Bravura. Uh, and so maybe you could tell us a little bit about Bravura. I, I, I know people can read the whole blog post on it. We don't need to rehash the whole thing. But if someone hasn't read the blog post, what is Bravura? Sure. So like you say, you know, scoring programs need special fonts because, uh, you know, the all of the funny dots and squiggles that you find in a scoring <laughs> program and indeed in any musical score aren't generally found in Times New Roman or Arial or even <laughs> MS Comic Sans. So yeah, you need you need your own font, um, and there have been uh, obviously lots of uh, fonts over the years. So the first one of note is Sonata, which was actually the first original typeface that Adobe ever designed, if you can believe it. And it wasn't really? actually a text typeface. Prior to that, all of the fonts they'd done were kind of recuts of existing, um, you know, 
metal type, you know, not not digital right. type, metal type. Um, and so that kind of started the trend. And then there have been others, Petrucci, Finale's One, and the Opus Family. And yes, you're right, I, I worked a bit on those, although never um, in terms of the original design and conception of any of the fonts that came with Sibelius. They were either um, done by done by Jonathan or by my former colleague Andrew Davis, um, or indeed we bought a couple in um, at various points as well. And and then yes, I had to kind of modify them and so on. But to actually design a new font from scratch that was a, that's a new experience for me, um, and I've really enjoyed it to be honest. It's been a, a, an enormous amount of work over the last. I've really been working on it since the new year, um, and it's been. I, I really can't actually even guess exactly how long it's taken to get to this point, but it's certainly in the order of hundreds of hours of work. And I'm sure anybody who's uh, who's watching or listening to this who's done any kind of type design will know just how time consuming it can be to uh, to really kind of try and get things looking just as you like them. Um, I mean, so where Bravura came from is that uh, obviously one of the fundamental things you have to decide about a font is what is it going to look like? You know, what are the design considerations that go into it? And I really wanted to do a music font that was very classical in appearance. I wanted to do a font that would look like the kind of music that, you know, certainly I grew up playing in my uh, sort of orchestral, very brief <laughs> and poor orchestral playing career um, <laughs> up until the end of my college days. And playing from all these lovely old editions, uh, you know, the Bright Kopf editions and the, the Shots editions, all from kind of the, uh, of all the classic repertoire that they haven't bothered to redo in, you know, the sort of late 20th century and early 21st century. So you're playing from reprints of, of original engravings that were done, you know, in in the last decades of the 19th century or possibly the early part of the 20th century. And there's a particular kind of look, uh, particularly to those uh, Germanic publishers and their music. And uh, it just really, it really, to me, that's what music looks like. And so that's what I set out to replicate um, with Bravura. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to uh, to kind of draw a lot of the inspiration for how the symbol should look from Notaset, which was a dry lettering um, kind of, transfer system a bit like Letraset, if you're familiar with that it's the same technology but with music in it rather than rather than with uh, with uh, printed type and um, although it's quite hard to come by these days because it really hasn't been uh, used much since the rise of the computer in the sort of late 80s early 90s but thanks to some very generous people who happen to be uh, probably as unhealthy hoarders as I am, uh, they were able to find, find some sheets that, that would give me, um, give me a good feel for the overall look of, of those shapes. And they're all drawn again from punches that were originally used by one of the German publishers. So they have the right look. And of course, the advantage of the dry transfer sheets is they're unencumbered by either being, you know, poorly reproduced and several generation reprints that you're seeing in a, a Dover score or whatever. And indeed, they don't have any staff lines or other things. Plus, if you're lucky, you can get hold of them at different rastral sizes or different staff sizes. And again, one of the things that really sets uh, beautifully produced music apart from, you know, well, computer-produced music, is that actually the shapes need to be different at different staff sizes so that um, the legibility is, is uh, you know, as optimal as possible at any staff size. So these were the kinds of considerations that I was thinking about when I started work on Bravura. Um, and pretty rapidly after I started, I discovered that actually, um, and because I also had in mind that rather than having lots and lots and lots of fonts in a family, like, say, the Opus family that I'd been working on on and off with Sibelius that ended up with 18 different fonts in it, you know, one for the main set of music symbols, one for chord symbols, one for sans serif chord symbols, one for figured bass, one for the brackets for figured bass, one for ornaments, blah, 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 and on, 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 on. And that was all really because those uh, fonts were conceived in the era that really preceded the popularization of open type and the fact that you can have 65,000 glyphs inside a font and all the rest of it. Um, so I wanted to also kind of rethink the way that the font would be put together so that um, we could come up with a, a, a simpler, more consistent way to actually package all the symbols that you need for um, any kind of score, really, uh, into a single font. And OpenType gives you the technology to do that. So I started to try and work out, well, OK, what symbols am I actually going to need to do? And uh, rapidly realized that that was a job in itself, just like putting the font together, actually working out what the symbol should be is another pretty major part of the job. 
So in addition to working on Bravura, I've also been working on um, a proposed standard for how music fonts should be laid out, mm. rather unimaginatively titled the standard music font layout, um, or Smoofle to its friends. I had to test whether it was Smuffle or Smoofle, but because all my colleagues are German, uh, in German it's definitely Smoofle, <laughs> not Smuffle, uh, so it's it's called Smoofle. And, um, you heard it here first. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So this was this was another major part of the work is to really try and do a survey of what are the symbols that are used in conventional music notation. Um, and so far, I've come up with eight hundred and ten. Uh, but actually, <laughs> since I put the blog post up on Thursday, and I also gave a presentation about the work that I'd been doing at the Music Encoding Conference in Mainz in Germany, uh, which was attended by people from the uh, community, primarily of the community of the Music Encoding Initiative, which is a, an alternative XML-based way of encoding music in a similar fashion to Music XML, but with a more um, scholarly bias. It's actually specialised in, uh, for example, managing the differences between different manuscripts or published sources and coming up with a consistent encoding of the document that that gives you that scholarly information. Um, and so, of course, the people who were in attendance there are all these wonderfully experienced and expert specialists in various subfields of, of music. You know, there were people there who were working on projects on Josquin or people who were working on projects uh, for uh, Weber or Sarti and other, you know, 18th and 19th century composers. So as soon as I say, hey, we're going to do this thing, I immediately get, oh, but you, have you got this particular kind of croche blanche notation or have you got all the right symbols for um, Salem's uh, Neum notation and blah, 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 blah. So, so now the floodgates are open and the, and the symbols are pouring in, um, which is great because it means that Smoofle will end up being a more comprehensive uh, list of what these things should be. But it's also a challenge because it means that ideally I really need to draw all of these things and add them to Bravura <laughs> so that Bravura remains uh, compliant with, with Smoofle. And it so would the be two a shame kind of if you hand didn't hand. have those nooms in, in your chant notation. That would right. it'd be a big problem. <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly. So, so yes, and I, I'm sure there's things that I don't even know about yet because uh, we're only a couple of days in. But I've already had some really... Uh, very detailed feedback about it from various mailing lists and so on where it's where it's starting to be discussed. Um, and hopefully what will happen with Smoofle is that it will become um, something of a of a of a standard across the applications that are working, you know, on scoring either directly or indirectly. Um, and I've certainly already been in touch with with representatives from a couple of other um, companies and indeed a couple of sort of the open source or um, startup type companies who are working in this field and there seems to be some interest in it so hopefully uh smoothful will actually improve the interoperability between these programs in a small way you know it's not it's not the big biggest deal in the world because hey there's plenty of music fonts out there but i think at the same time you know the standards that we've been working with in terms of building music fonts date back really nearly 30 years to when sonata arrived on the scene in 1985 um, and there's certainly not really been any agreement on how we should go beyond the 170 glyphs that were in Sonata. So Smoofle is an attempt to provide a suggestion for that. Um, and hopefully, uh, if it's deemed to be useful and we can get a kind of community built around it, we can actually start to uh, to come up with a, a consensus-driven consensus approach to standardising on how music fonts should be put together. Um, and that's kind of all again, a sort of a technical thing that maybe end users won't need to worry about. But hopefully the thing they do need to worry about, which is that they want their music to look great and they also want to be able to share files and share other sort of related resources like fonts between programs, this will be a step towards uh, making that um, a little bit easier than it is today. Right. In previous fonts, if, if I understand them correctly, music fonts were kind of a hack based on getting these music symbols into the standards that were used for language fonts for for alphanumeric fonts right yeah that's right so i mean i think again it was it made a lot of sense when they started you know when cleo huggins did sonata for adobe this was in the you know this was a few years before even finale was around so the kind of scoring programs that were around in the 80s they were dos based things that didn't really have 
uh, fonts in that way. You know, Score, for example, the you know very uh, venerable Score now, been around since the late '60s or really the early '70s, since it moved off the Stanford Mini Computer. Uh, but that doesn't use fonts at all. That uses its own built-in library of PostScript commands and so on. So, right. when Clio yeah. started in the '80s, there wasn't a Finale or a Sibelius to kind of target. So, she was really uh, doing a music font. Apparently, she was a violinist herself, and she was looking for a way of producing music that looked better than what had been done before and postscript was a new technology so she kind of did this font almost in the sort of field of dreams way as i understand it you know if i build it maybe they will come um and so she she worked on the font uh but in order to actually make it useful for somebody who didn't have a scoring program she mapped the the way the the font was sort of set out onto the roman keyboard so that you could type it on a qwerty keyboard and she used either visual mnemonics so an ampersand looks a little bit like a treble clef if you squint so that's how you draw a treble clef a g clef and q is a good uh, mnemonic for quarter notes so lowercase q gives you a stem up quarter note and shift q capital q gives you a stem down quarter note and she went along like that and so that was really like you say it's kind of a hack because uh, of course in those days unicode was uh, was just a gleam in the unicode consortium's eye and there wasn't really any way of working with these things other than you know pick a code page any code page and whack your symbols in there uh, but these days of course we now do have unicode which means that you've got uh, well an effectively unlimited set of code points that you can use. And indeed, the Unicode standard does include a range of musical symbols. And the chap who designed that range of symbols was at the conference I was at this week. Um, and it was interesting talking to him about the constraints that were put on him when he proposed that. Uh, basically, the Unicode consortium said, you can have as many symbols as you like, as long as it's no more than 220, uh, which <laughs> is not enough. It's just not enough for, for Western music notation, let alone adding any other uh, sort of for, more for Far Eastern or African or other sorts of notation systems. Mm-hmm. So that kind of initiative to to build a standard set of glyphs inside Unicode was not necessarily doomed from the start, but certainly constrained to the point where it wasn't going to be the answer to all of all of our prayers, as it were. And I think that's probably why, despite that having been around as long as, say, Sibelius for Windows, um, there aren't really any fonts that make use of that Unicode standard. So what we're trying to do with Smoothful is is kind of, if, if perhaps maybe we'll propose this to the Unicode Consortium formally, if we can get to the point where we feel like we have agreement about how it should work, although... I already know it's going to be way, way more than 220 symbols, so we'll have to see what I think about that. But um, we we want to build this in the what's called the private use area, which is basically an area in Unicode where you can do what you like. Um, and there is no actual agreement about how should the private use area be used. But the hope is that by coming together with a group of experts um, and a group of perhaps industry kind of companies as well coming together, we can come up with something that might become at least a transitional standard that might then be worth proposing to Unicode and then having it as as a range. But I think that's a that's a long way down the road because we have to we have to really figure out what symbols we actually need before we can figure out you know is this going to be uh, something worth proposing to Unicode or not. But hopefully, um, even though it'll still be a little bit of a hack, because, of course, the difficulty with using stuff in these other sort of weird places in Unicode that don't map onto your keyboard is that you can't then really use the symbols in a font like Bravura just by, you know, opening up, say, Word or Pages or Text Edit or something and typing on your keyboard. You have to type funky control codes to get any kind of symbols out of Bravura. So in a sense, the hack that Clio came up with back in the 80s was a really good one because it actually Mm -hmm. made the font usable. Um, Now, of course, we're lucky that we have complicated, complicated, (laughs) listen Mm -hmm. to me, my prejudice is showing, we have software like (laughs) Finale and Sibelius to uh, to allow us to get at these characters without having to actually know how to type them, uh, which means that it doesn't really matter, in a sense, whether they are way off into the nether regions of Unicode that you can't type or whether they are, you know, Q for quarter note. Um, so hopefully what this allows us to do is, is just come up with one place where each symbol should be, have an agreement on that, and then these fonts will be easily shareable between applications. Right. And and by by making your standard an open standard and then opening your, your font that you created, opening Bravura to everyone, I think that will... Obviously, that will help the adoption of the standard uh, by, yeah, by having this this thing that they can immediately plug into their 
uh, implementation of Smoothful uh, by by taking Bravura and being able to do something with it, which is which is great. And I'd be I'll be very curious to see what comes of that. I I would love to see somebody take Smoothful and turn it into a, a font that I can use to just type words about music is always one of the tricky things. Is oh man, that is so difficult. To type yes. a sentence that involves a flat symbol. Sure. <clears throat> so, <laughs> yeah, so I think that was... like... yeah, go Sorry, ahead. go ahead, Sam. No, 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 go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say that it, that is actually still a challenge, even with a standard like Smoothful, because um, Smoothful is only kind of half the story, if you like. Smoothful says what symbol should be where on what code point, but it doesn't provide in itself any guidance on okay so what the heck should the font actually be like in terms of <laughs> what should the metrics be should the how should the characters be arranged relative to the baseline say you know of the bottom of the letter a or a b where should the flat sign be and how big should it be and indeed one of the one of the big challenges is you know that you probably can't use the same font and have it work really nicely in a symbolically driven program like a Sibelius or a Finale or our new program and have that same font work nicely and play well inside a text-based environment like Word or InDesign or whatever. So I think that in addition to providing the, um, the guidelines for what symbol should be mapped to what code point, we're also going to need to prepare two sets of guidelines probably for how fonts should be actually, how fonts that want to be compliant with Smoothful should be set up in terms of metrics based on a text-based application and metrics based on a symbolic scoring application. Uh, but I do think it's going to need to be two fonts. And some of the guys that I was talking to at the conference were saying, hey, I'm sure we can generate this automatically. If you do one like this, then we'll just do some funky transformations and we'll generate one that works in a word processor. So, so there are some interesting folks out there who are, who are going to start putting their, putting their brains to bear on that, on that particular challenge. But I think it will require in the end two fonts, but I think I agree with you. I think it would be very neat if you could have, you know, maybe a bravura for scoring and a bravura for text, and mm -hmm. you could easily use either of those and know that, you know, that font is also freely available because it's, as you say, under an open font license, which means that you can share that with anybody else. You know, you need to send your document to somebody else. You don't need to worry about them licensing the font in any way because you can just do what the heck you like with it pretty much. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think hopefully we'll be able to sort of solve all of these problems step by step. But it is going to be an incremental uh, incremental job and it'll take a while uh, but I'm hopeful I think it's uh, it's a good step and I've been encouraged by the initial response to date yeah. so well, you're talking about the... it as if you're afraid it's going to be a little clunky but you're talking to a guy who's had to like export graphics from finale and then <laughs> paste those in as jpegs into Microsoft Word in order to do his performance instructions for scores you know if it's less clunky than that, it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> well, that's what we'll shoot for then. That's what, that's what we all do. That's I, think, a baseline. I think all of us have done that. No, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I I hack around and and make a glyph and put it in a thing, but I'm weird. Um, anyways, I just it, I just I'll just capture. Uh, either I'll capture the the screen in a certain yeah, spot, right. or I'll just export like a you know if you can export an image or that is. A certain select select measure or something like that. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I th I think the font we should say is a very beautiful looking font. It's very beefy. I it's like bold. the yeah, I like bold. the name for it. Brevure is a great name for the the boldness of the font. Yeah, um, and I've had to go in and like I often will go in depending on how small my score is going to be and like actually thicken the stem widths yeah. <laughs> throughout the score anyway. Because when you make a big like wind ensemble score and you're printing it out, it's like they disappear almost. So yeah, I'm it's interesting. I think that the um, it's it's one of these sort of computer. It's one of the consequences of computer engraving, and I don't know exactly what it is that's caused this to happen. Uh, because certainly, say Sibelius's defaults were never as thin as Finale's, which are incredibly thin even to this day. And right. I wonder whether maybe part of it is that when these products were kind of coming up in the late 80s and 90s, maybe home printer technology and certainly screen display technology wasn't as good as it is today. Mm -hmm. And I think on some level, maybe the the sort of the appearance that these programs have by default is kind of a product of their time, a product of you know the technology that was available when they were developed. You know, now here we are designing our new program in the in the world where you know a 600 even 1200 dpi is is sort of 
can be bought for tens of pounds or dollars rather than hundreds or thousands. And we've got retina resolution displays not only on our laptops, but also on the mobile phones we're carrying around in our pockets, you know. So it's a completely different world. And I wonder whether it's something to do with the the consequence of the technology that these programs grew up with that means that, you know, today, printing out on a good printer, the default appearance of, of certainly Finale and perhaps even Sibelius is, is really a fair bit thinner than the kind of music that, that we were all playing from that was produced in the pre-computer age. And although you might say, oh, well, some of that is thicker than it should be because it's been reproduced over and over again. This is a reprint of a reprint. And obviously, you know, even through photographic reproduction, those originals kind of degrade over time. But I think there is something to be said. Well, obviously, I feel this way because I kind of have designed Bravura with this in mind. But I believe that that music should be a little bit blacker on the page. And when you imagine that, you know, a trombonist is going to be reading that from from nearly six feet away when he's sitting in front of his desk and maybe he doesn't have perfect lighting, particularly if he's in a pit rather than on a stage. I think there is really something to be said for for making the font a little bit more substantial um, and you're absolutely right. That's why we called it Bravura, because uh, because that embodies uh, the design principles that went into into putting the font together. Well, it's, Another... it's, it's so exciting to hear you talk about these things that you can reimagine from the ground up because uh, you're imagining it for the you know for the, not for the first time, obviously, but you're you're considering things that you hadn't considered before because you're starting with you know. From, from a blank page, a blank screen, uh, t- with the current technology. What were you going to say, Sam? Well, I, basically the same kind of thing. Like, uh, there was a blog post that you had where you could actually see some of your handwritten notes. You had, like, a picture, and, uh, like, smaller than a minor second interval. <laughs> like, that, everybody on the panel went nuts when we saw that. I'm like, oh, of course, you can, you're going to be able to use this to do microtonal music and, you know. Um, and I'm hoping that it solves all the problems because you inv- inev- inevitably with Finale and probably with Sibelius, I'm a Finale guy, you like, you just, why won't the program do this? It just makes so much sense for it to do this and it won't, you know, <laughs> something simple that you think it should do, especially if you're, you know, a modern composer, like different time signatures on different lines or, and I know that stuff's possible, but you got to finagle around and, and kind of beat on it with a hammer to make it do it. Um, that kind of stuff, the, the kinds of tools that a modern composer would want is what I'm looking forward to seeing in this program. So there's my, there's my plug. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope, Sam, you won't be disappointed. I mean, I think, obviously, we, we really want to... Um, I, I mean, we're, we're still at such an early stage in terms of what we've actually kind of built. Our dreams are way, way bigger than our achievements today, you know. <laughs> but I think the reason that we're... That we're you know, taking our time is because we want to really try and make sure that, um, you know, we don't put any fundamental restrictions in place at this stage that are going to preclude things like having subdivisions of the octave greater than 12 or having uh, polymetric music that really actually works rather than having to kind of fake it. Um, and I know there'll be people who'll be quick to rush into the comments and say, hey, you can do all this in Lily Pond or you can do it in Score or whatever. <laughs> uh, but generally speaking, to date, there hasn't been um, a program that that you know perhaps your average folks who don't want to learn a complicated text-based inputting language or want to learn a huge number of workarounds in terms of you know hiding bar lines here or reusing this articulation as an accidental or whatever it might be that sorts of workarounds that you often have to employ to do things that are slightly out of the uh, sort of ordinary in the existing programs. And I think, inevitably screw up the playback just as a Sure, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because the program, and lots of things like the spacing and the layout, because the program doesn't really understand what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the uh, one of the kind of watchwords of, of the approach that we're trying to take is to is to really build the most rich semantic model of music that we can conceive of in terms of making sure that the program understands enough musical concepts like a human does, or at least approaching the way that a human does, that um, it will not sort of put those barriers in your way because it'll have this fixed notion that a bar must have four beats in it or, um, you know, you must have the same time signature in every staff or you must have only 12 subdivisions of the octave or whatever it might be. And so to really try and um, address those at a very low level um, so that so that the program is built with a, a foundation that's a little bit more forgiving and a little bit broader in its 
uh, in its uh, sort of attempt to map out the world of music, because fundamentally that's what these scoring programs do. It's a very, you know, I don't need to tell you guys, you're all composers and you use this software yourselves, but it's a complicated thing, you know, in terms of a symbolic language that represents music. I always remember the a quote from a, a musicologist who said that, you know, notated music is not music. It is merely a representation of part of it. And that's absolutely true. And like anything, it's a language and you've got to have a broad enough vocabulary in order to be able to express yourself fully. And of course, over the last hundred years in particular, that vocabulary that's in use by composers and so on has broadened outside the range of what, you know, Brahms and Mahler and, and chaps like that were doing at the end of the 19th and start of the 20th century. But in a funny kind of a way, because the rules become a little bit more complicated, or in some cases a heck of a lot more complicated, to actually try and teach a computer about how these things should work, um, you know, the computer representation of music or the way that a computer thinks about music is sort of at that level rather than thinking about the sorts of uh, things that have been innovated through the 20th and into the 21st centuries. So I can't promise that we're going to actually be able to solve all of these problems, although that, that's obviously what we'd love to be able to do. But certainly our intention is to conceive of music in a way that is a bit broader than the way that, you know, the Sibelius and the Finales of this world have historically sort of considered the fundaments of music so that we can have a stab at making those things a little bit easier and a little bit more natural inside the environment that we're building. Yes, that's, I think, what we're all hoping for. Exactly. Yeah, and that, that semantic understanding for, for, to, to, for the, the program to understand the input semantically so that I can operate on it and it won't break everything right. is, is amazing. I, I remember uh, using workarounds for feathered beams before feathered beams were easily accomplished. And anytime anything on the page moved, if I needed to transpose it, then the feathers would all be on the wrong part of the staff. And it's, it's, it's really great that you're trying to think of this stuff uh, semantically. And that's especially problematic, I think, with things like feathered beams. Anything related to rhythm is, is I think, particularly tricky. Something like, you know, I've written a lot of music that has uh, unmetered sections and, you know, figuring out the workaround for the unmetered section. And I've popped things over to Adobe Illustrator and, you know, remapped the the vectors in Il Illustrator and then popped the Illustrator stuff back over to Sibelius before. And it's it's uh, it's great that you're trying to consider how the program understands those very strange things as opposed to just as graphics as actually symbols that mean something musical absolutely and and like you say about rhythm in particular um you know we we've been out and visited with a lot of europe's top publishers um folks who are using sibelius and finale and score today to produce their music and almost without exception that the number one concern they have is around the rhythmic complexity of music you know this is not a new thing we're really talking about Stravinsky coming along with the right of Str spring in like 1917 or whatever it was and really kind of upsetting the apple cart in a big way but we're a hundred years on and, and we haven't really got the technology to cope with to cope with that and the consequences of that and the fallout of that um, that have that have sort of been spilling out in ever decreasing circles ever since then so really um, yeah we, we're, we're taking that particular aspect very seriously and really trying to think about how we can make the program very flexible in terms of the way it thinks about rhythm and indeed the way it thinks about pitch and hopefully the way that it thinks about everything from how you set up your score in terms of how you map instruments and staves and things together so that you you've got as you say a the program understands what you've input. That that is indeed what you know a, a semantically richer model will hopefully give us is the fact that you won't be forced into workarounds so often. I can't promise there'll never be workarounds, but <laughs> you'll be forced into them less often because right. the program has a richer model and it understands more about what composers and arrangers are trying to do today uh, than than the sort of previous generation of programs. What well, and I would think very that, excited. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I would think excited. the trick would be to not leave behind the people that just want to do a string quartet transcription of a pop tune. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think 
one of the one of the challenges that you know that we face, and this was always true when we were adding features to Sibelius as well, is how do you make sure that the program does what um, you know? I hate to use a phrase like a naive user, but somebody who who is beginning to learn the program, for example, or is taking their first steps into the world of of composing, and obviously we do really want to to address those people as well. But in a sense, we've kind of got a conscious strategy here to to really try and make sure that we aim for the top of the tree, aim for the top of the pyramid and address the needs of the most demanding users, whether they are professional composers or publishers or whatever, um, and then hope that we can trickle down to everybody else. But of course, the challenge there is then making sure that, you know, it's not too easy to end up with a polymetric score or a different key signature in every stave or, you know, layout going bananas because you've, you've triggered some highly esoteric feature. So yeah, we, we really have a challenge ahead of us to make sure that we don't put too many barriers in the way to stop the pros and the people who really know what they want to get it exactly that level of control that they require, uh, but also still at the same time, make sure that, you know, for example, a a music teacher in a hurry who just wants to produce a quick transcription before band or or somebody who's just doing a simple arrangement for their choir or whatever it might be. That's me, by the way. I'm just doing simple stuff for my choir. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to have those people not, not have uh, lots of um, sort of what would possibly to them end up being confusing options shown to them before they get where they need to go. So it's a real balance uh, about making the program appear simple enough for anybody to use, but also have that sort of, if you like, hidden depth that will that will make it um, the hopefully the professional's tool of choice. Yeah. Well, well, Daniel, it's been so so great talking to you. We've gone much longer than we normally go with our with our guest part of the show, and we started late because I was doing dumb computer things. Um, <laughs> but we're going to bail on most of our news stories, but there are a couple of really, uh, important things. Uh, Sam, do you want to go, th- go through these couple of things you, you picked out? Um, uh, well, we have to mention that, uh, Patrick, you want to say this name for me since you claim to know exactly how it's pronounced. It's on, on oh. to you. On to you. you. 97 <laughs> years old, passed away this week. And, and so he did not get ripped off as far as, you know. Time on the Earth goes. Um, to uh, get ripped if off. If you're not familiar with his music, uh, very cool. You know, definitely, well, I mean, it says it in the New York Times piece that we're going to have posted, but very, very uh, affected by Stravinsky, it seems. Um, and just wrote a lot of great music. Wasn't as prolific as some other composers, but great composer and a cool guy because a couple of months ago we had, uh, he won the, uh, I forgot the name of the art, the award. I just looked it up. Uh, anyway, I, I threw it to Sam because I thought you were going to bring up Ray Manzarek. <laughs> I'm going to mention Ray Manzarek next. <laughs> okay. But, but he won that $200,000 award. And uh, split it with some people. for And just split it with some awesome. young composers, which is really yeah, cool. Um, um, well, I was going to say about Duty is that he's just uh, you know one of these oh, guys the that Prize. gets yeah, uh, overlooked Prize. a lot. But he, he, was, he was extremely inventive in... Uh, in, in a way that didn't leave anybody behind. I think it's it's as 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 Sam likes to say, as weird ugly music goes. Uh, his weird ugly music is very approachable. It's very melodic and contrapuntal, and it's it's easy to to just dive into. There is depth there, but the surface uh, has a lot of intrigue as well uh, in in Dutiu's music. I think you'll see a lot of. Uh, I mean, he certainly. Had a French influence too, as we'll see. Oh, the, yeah, he's pick of <laughs> being French, you know. Um, it's very French. You, you'll certainly hear that in the pick of the week. Yeah. So, and also this week, uh, Ray Manzarek, keyboard player, uh, and most some people might not realize the the his left hand was the bass player <laughs> for the Doors, and I think oh, that right. was a big part of their sound. And you know, I think I think the Doors and him specifically, because he had a lot to do with their sound, had a big effect on. You know, I think he's an important figure in in American music. Um, he passed away at seventy four this this week. And uh, one last thing, a, a friend of the show plug, uh, Carrie Andrew has a chamber opera that she's written that is going to be premiered in uh, on July nineteenth. And this is the one that I that uh, that uh, that uh, Daniel's going to be able to go to. But we'll have a link. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll have a link to that, and there's a video talking about it. I, it's it sounds pretty. Are you pretty booking cool. Daniel for public appearances? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to encourage Daniel to go and see this uh, chamber opera. Right. I mean, the man is a family. <laughs> and, and Daniel, actually, you should uh, check her out in general. She has a a, a, a vocal group a three female singer vocal group called Juice Vocal. I don't know if that sounds familiar at all. But they they're out of the UK and it's if you like singing, they do some pretty inventive singing. Great, I'll check um, it out. Yeah. And so we'll anyway, have a link to that. Uh it's time I think for our pick of the week, Sam. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> we'll take of the week. Of the week. <laughs> <laughs> you you threw me off there with the delay. Um <laughs> Anyway, our pick of the week is uh, by Henri Dutilleux. Uh, he's probably most well-known for his orchestral music, and so uh, we thought it'd be fun uh, to, to pick something that's not that. Um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of people citing uh, the cello concerto and a uh, new Esa Pekka Salonen recording of a uh, of vocal piece. He wrote a lot of music for vocalists and orchestra. This is a piano prelude, actually, called uh, D'Ombre et de Silence, uh, the shade and, uh, of, of Shade and of Silence, or of Shadow and of Silence, uh, by Henri Dutilleux. Uh, and uh, so, so before we go, Daniel, I have some parting comments. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> Wait, are we streaming? I, I, are we streaming? This show is still going. This is still the show. Oh, yeah. Okay. So as, right. as we were talking, as you were talking about the program, I had some thoughts. One is, imagine how cool it would be to right-click and you see an option that says, calculate tempo modulation. <laughs> <laughs> like it'll do the math and tell you like this eighth note needs to now equal 76.4 beats per minute or whatever you know like the uh elliot carter stuff but it'll do it for you and this would this would uh irritate theory teachers if you're able to select a bunch of notes and right click and say calculate z relation or something like that you know so, okay he's like he's like okay <laughs> and lastly and lastly who has two thumbs and would love to be a beta tester. <laughs> Join the queue, Sam. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this, this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate your time. And uh, we, if, if, if you're interested, we'd love to have you back when, when things get a little further along with this project. Uh, maybe when we have a name that we can call it. Uh, <laughs> And uh, good luck with everything that you're doing. And we're, we're really looking forward to, to seeing what's going on. Uh, and, and again, we'll give you the last opportunity to, to plug your, your places on the Internet. Thanks very much for having me. I would love to come back on the show again. It's been great fun and you're all great chaps and I would love to come back on again. So please do have me back. So if you want to find me on the internet, you can find me on Twitter at D Spreadbury. My blog for Steinberg is at blog.steinberg.net. And if you want to drop me an email directly, my email address is d.spreadbury at steinberg.de. So it's just a little d.spreadbury rather than de at the beginning. 
that's probably made that more confusing. But <laughs> sure, I, I wasn't my... thinking that until you said it just now. Yeah. <laughs> Mess that up. Never mind. Find me on Twitter and I'll give you my email. Address. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Indeed. Uh, so that's going to do it for this week's show. You can find links to the tiny handful of stories that we talked about and all of, all of the things that, that Daniel has going on on our show notes. Uh, and you'll find those at soundnotion.tv slash SN. And you can also uh, leave a comment there if you have any thoughts on any of the things that we talked about. We certainly spent the last hour sharing some of our strong opinions about things. And we don't want the conversation to end there. Uh, like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. We're SN, uh, Sound Notion. On Twitter, you can use hashtag SN Weekly on Twitter to suggest stories for the show. I'm personally at Dave McDow. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Sam is at Housegoy. Nate is at a Nate Tree. And Daniel is at D Spreadberry. Um, you can also please subscribe to us on YouTube. We used to stream the show on YouTube and then YouTube changed some things and we need a thousand subscribers if we're going to continue streaming on YouTube. So if you're a YouTube person, if you could subscribe to us, that'd be great. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes to get all the episodes downloaded automatically. And if you don't like the video thing, you can subscribe to the audio feed, though you won't see our smiling faces. Um, if you'd like to support the show, you can uh, use the Amazon affiliate search thing on our site, soundnotion.tv. Um, Soundnotion's introduction includes music by our own Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week. Smoothle. Smoothle. <laughs> <laughs> Arrested development.